This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. There's a few reasons why this is a thrill for me. Uh, The first is that I'm speaking to uh, the king, or at least the current king, when it comes to reflection and pontification, all things that are Lebanese politics and economics. So I'm a humble little servant in face of the emperor. That's first. This is recorded? This yes, is this recorded. is recorded. Of course, it's recorded. No, I won't accept that. I won't accept that. <laughs> let's, let's put it the, f- f- uh, your 15 minutes of fame are stretched <laughs> very long. <laughs> but in, 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 in real sort of friendship as well, I'm, I'm very honored to have met you now uh, two times. Uh, most recently, a fabulous dinner. And uh, just the ability to converse on, on difficult subjects with you, for me, is a thrill. And I sense that there's a built-in optimism within you when you discuss things that are happening here. And that's rare. Uh, In my own circle, I tend to hear the very negative and bleak assessments when it comes to the things that we know. And there isn't really much optimism anyway in this country at the moment. But when I speak to you, I hear a hint, a hint of positive change. It could take time, but it's coming. And that's my understanding of your, maybe your larger sort of uh, paradigm that something has ended, something that was bad and something new that is better is beginning. But I hope I'm getting that right and I'm not overstepping with these thoughts that, that you do see positive change happening, that you're not a pessimist by nature and quite the contrary, you may even be an optimist without sounding too romantic here. So you correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you, Roni. So I will not comment on the introduction. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let, let's get to the to, to the point. So yes, you you are right. I am an optimistic. I'm, I'm uh, my friend always. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm a subject of bluffs uh, for, for from all my friends because I always see the positive aspect of things. So it's the trait of character, uh, I would say, but I I believe it's also uh, grounded or it could be justified uh, when you look at what's happening in Lebanon. Mm. First of all, I I want to say that uh, we must be optimistic because this pessimism uh, has become contagious in Lebanon and it has become a posture uh, Mm. to always be negative uh, about the country. And this is really bad gets you depressed and you, you tend to see only negative aspects of things. Uh, I'm well aware that a lot of uh, uh, things going on are really negative. So um, I, li- I live in the country. Uh, I'm not uh, totally detached from what's happening. But the reasons that motivate my optimism are precisely what you said. Uh, I believe that a big illusion is that has vanished Mm. and uh, when you had that illusion in place change was very difficult because we had the illusion that the system was working Uh, i believe that we are living today a systemic crisis uh, uh, at both uh, the economic the social and the political uh, levels Um, and when the illusion was here was very difficult to engage with people. It was very difficult to tell to people uh, that you believed that there is something uh, uh, bad going in, that the the, the system was not sustained. And no one would really uh, care about those arguments. And uh, we saw a big motivation today, especially uh, of the youth, 
uh, to get involved in politics, to understand, to uh, debate, uh, to try to reflect, to envisage what could be a new system uh, for Lebanon. This is precisely because the old illusion is that. Now, to, to describe a bit the illusion, I, I believe that the illusion was quite deep. Uh, and it was triple layered. Uh, uh, we, we had, uh, 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 first of all, uh, an illusion about the political system that mm -hmm. we could live uh, and thrive and develop uh, while having the worst sectarian system in place. Uh, and this was natural and this wouldn't prevent the development of Lebanon, uh, wouldn't prevent the establishment of a, of a modern state. And this has proven to be wrong. This is the worst system uh, that we could have. Uh, I recognize diversity in Lebanon. I recognize also the right of people to claim a sectarian belonging and don't misinterpret uh, uh, my, my, sure. my uh, But what I'm saying is that the system, the governance system, we, we have this sectarian bureaucracy in, in place uh, cannot make any country or any building or any corporation uh, function. This is the worst of all uh, system. Uh, you are always seeking the minimum, uh, minimal common denominator, and this will introduce also the sectarian bureaucracy. It introduces clientelism and so on. So this myth has fallen today, and people are reflecting, uh, 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 how shall I replace uh, this old system by a more modern system. The second one is uh, uh, about sovereignty, sovereignty and, and state. So we had also the illusion, maybe not all of us, uh, but it was the common or, or the official dogma that a state could be established or develop uh, while being not sovereign, while uh, not detaining uh, the right to declare war or peace by not having a foreign uh, uh, policy, by having its foreign uh, policy hijacked. Uh, and also some Lebanese thought that this is part of the game and uh, that we could establish a functioning state with a, an incomplete sovereignty. So I believe also that this myth is largely dead today. And people also are thinking how to position Lebanese foreign policy. Should we adopt neutrality? What does neutrality mean? Uh, how to, uh, 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 let's say, end the Hezbollah phenomenon, not, not as a political party, but as a militia in Lebanon uh, that uh, has uh, the upper hand over uh, sovereign matters as act of war and peace. Uh, the third illusion is the economic and social illusion. Uh, we also have an official dogma in Lebanon that is very unpleasant, uh, that is about the private sphere versus the public sphere. Yes. Le Lebanon official dogma is that private sector can do everything and right. that you don't need any public space. And by public space, I mean everything that is public. It could mm -hmm. be from a public garden, a public transportation, public electricity, public waste management, yes. public breathing space for this country, for the people. And we privatized everything. We even privatized the, the mindsets uh, of the people. And this was the official dogma. The excellence of Lebanon is within the private sector and private entrepreneurship. And that this should not be regulated. Uh, we ended up in an anarchy uh, without any space to breathe, to connect, uh, and this killed eventually every space for citizenship. So, okay, this is maybe a long answer, uh, Roni, uh, and excuse me for it, but I'm, I'm very glad that those myths are, are today bad. Uh, and I'm very glad that a part of the population is engaged in thinking, uh, politics is about policies. It's about designing the city uh, 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 and designing the, the interaction between people uh, uh, and the public sphere. So I'm very happy today that I see engagement. Uh, I'm, I'm solicited uh, daily and not me, uh, a lot of people 
uh, for webinars, for uh, sessions, interactions, you have applications. You have, so you, you have a lot of dynamism. And for me, a depressed people and a depressed country wouldn't show that dynamism. So I'm just acknowledging the creativity of Lebanese people and their eagerness to find solutions for the country and trying to transform that into a positive discourse and an optimistic vision for Lebanon. I think you eloquently spelled out uh, my whole, uh, my life on earth as it relates to <laughs> Lebanon. And I'm glad that you spelled it out in a way that's very easy to understand, almost that there are pillars that are being unraveled gradually. And I like that you're using the word illusion. I think that resonates. It's almost a, a facade. There was a false reality for decades. And we're now, in a way, waking up from that slumber. So I appreciate the way you spelled it out. Also, that you're able to, in a way, line up two things, I think. First is the, the essence of Lebanon, which is this very strange power-sharing confessional construct and private enterprise, which is what we do really well, but able to offer some nuance, throwing in their sovereignty and foreign policy. So there's a lot to get into. But before we go into that terrain, which is very important, there's something that we both share. You have obviously a, a vast audience and, and uh, you're far more appealing to look at than me anyway. But we've spoken to Depends on the tastes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're right. You're right. Whoever, uh, whoever you're dodging, you can send my way. I'll, I'll sort of entertain them. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but a lot of these names are familiar to both of us. Uh, these are experts in the field. And I like that you even said policy, and that's the core of politics, to offer policy and, and almost strategy for state building. A lot of these people are, are familiar names. They come with a lot of uh, intellect and, and obviously they've, well, they've studied the issue and they're, they're experts in the field. Is that part of what's shaping your hope in the future? Because, and I ask you, because I am feeling that, that yes. in, within my own sort of experience that the more I speak to these minds that are in Lebanon pursuing against the odds, the more hope I have, even if that's not coming from within naturally, but it, it resonates and it almost, um, it's very appealing to say that there are people that are still trying against the odds. Is that a familiar experience to you? Absolutely. You, you really uh, hit the, the, the central point that is also behind the, the, the optimism. Uh, the, the approach uh, I took with, with LBC uh, in Ashrin Tletin uh, was to focus on uh, emerging thought leaders uh, on, on some technical specialists to give a voice to those people that were voiceless. They were voiceless because po politics was about nothing in Lebanon. It was about slogans, mere slogans, right. and it was about personal relations. So yes. I like you, we are allied, I don't like you. And uh, uh, politicians always, uh, you know, at the heart of their discourse is, I had dinner with the, the other politician, or I called him, and this is very important. <laughs> Who cares about all that? So to, to get back to what you asked, so yes, Lebanon as a, any country, uh, because I don't like also this very self-centered uh, approach about Lebanese being uh, extraordinary people. I, I believe in all countries of the world, you would find gems as you find in Lebanon. Sure. Uh, the problem is that in Lebanon, those people were completely uh, overshadowed by the ambient uh, uh, politics, and that the contrast that exists between our lousy political class and talents we have, the gap is really very, very big. And that's yes. what's astonishing. Yeah. Uh, you have financial experts, technical experts, energy experts, waste experts. You have experts in practically every field. And right. those people are not in power. Those people are not heard. No, no one asked them or used to ask them uh, their opinion about how things should go in Lebanon. Uh, uh, so those people were not really opinion shapers. So uh, the more I meet 
those people and the more we try to expose them and very also honestly i'm not alone in that a lot of people are doing that you are doing that uh, the more i feel optimistic now there is a, a, a small also a transition those people not all of them but i i believe that uh, uh, they should get more involved in politics uh, uh, for me the solution to lebanon is politics uh, politics is a noble art. Uh, politics is to put all those technicalities in, in, the, the, in the service of the community. Uh, so it's one thing being a technical expert. Uh, it's another thing to promote a policy. Uh, and uh, so th this is at the heart of our mission is to try to shed the light uh, uh, on ethical. Ethics is very important also. I'll, I'll also stop on the word because Lebanon is so corrupt with uh, a culture of corruption. Corruption in Lebanon is not just a practice. Uh, it has become a culture uh, that is not condemned uh, socially, or I, I don't want to generalize, of course, but that, that, it, that got to be practically a bit accepted, and that's a pity. And you meet a lot of people uh, that are so ethical uh, and those people merit a lot of acknowledgement because they yes. live a very unethical uh, uh, country, uh, a country dominated by conflict of interest, a, co a country dominated by malpractice. Uh, so I, 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 those people, the energy of those people, ethic those people, they really feed me. I, I, I thrive when I meet those people and I try always to uh, uh, engage them and to push them to be more vocal and engaged in politics because this is what we need. I'll say this, and I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Uh, you made it easier for independent voices that are promoting that ethical, honest dialogue. You made it easier for these voices to shine because it's not the job of just independent media with small outlets on podcasts or YouTube channels. I think it's the job of traditional media and mainstream media. And the fact that you're, you bulldozed into LBC and offered a different take. And I, I don't know how, I'm not sure about the background story, but I, I do know enough now to know that you are heavily involved in at least determining what voices you want to hear and what voices you're not interested in. And you really put independent policy-minded people at the forefront. But that jumping from, in a way, pontification and expertise, and even academia at times, you, you bring experts from universities and these people that are well-versed in terrain, getting them into politics. Before we go down, before we enter the illusion stuff, that transition, and, and you mentioned that you want them to be political, that it's a noble goal. Do you think the foundation is there yet for these people to enter power? Or is it premature? Because my sense, my understanding is that Lebanon is full of experts, and Lebanon has been full of experts for, for many years, but the foundation is flawed, and it hasn't been corrected. So that an energy expert, let's say, actually enters the, <laughs> the halls of power, or a finance expert is part of the central bank fabric or even socially minded person can, can use that in politics beyond just talking and discussing. And I hope I'm asking it right. That, that no. yeah, because I, I still don't know if that foundation is there and that could be the reason why these people are not in power. Yes, th thank you, Roni. It's a, it's a very important question. Uh, I, I have two elements uh, or, or two possible uh, answers. Uh, Yes, I, be, I believe there is readiness or the, the ground is here, but we are still not uh, really there. Mm. One, two, two maybe missing elements. The, the, the first element is to, to, to get uh, to the power or to, uh, yes, to, to uh, get the power, you must claim it. And you must, there is a whole posture of saying, I want to be in power. And <laughs> today, today uh, this is very important. 
today Lebanese are very shy. About mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even nascent party, reformers parties, uh, those groups, uh, old or, or young, or I don't know, you, you have a myriad of, of young parties, uh, older. they still do not dare to claim the power. When you do not claim the power, you are not perceived as being an, a, a credible alternative. When you do politics, the goal is to get uh, to power. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you don't have this goal, uh, then politics is completely useless. You shouldn't yeah. do it. So I believe that there's still in our democratic uh, 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 education or scenery, uh, 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 alternative parties and personalities still find it hard to claim uh, that they want to get to power. This is a very important. I'm not saying that they will get there in a month or two or three. Right. Uh, I'm yes. saying that the posture is very important. It's critical to be perceived as a credible uh, alternative. Uh, the, the second also uh, uh, aspect I want to discuss is also a flow we have in the public debate, in, in the discourse. Uh, in Lebanon, we have a very weird notion for me that it's called techno. <laughs> Technopaths are like a bunch of technical people, like alien, who would be parachuted. And you know, those are technocrats. So they have the answer, necessarily. So you bring a technocrat, he will fix the energy. You bring a waste management expert, he will fix the waste issue. This is a very stupid idea. They have superpowers that we don't they know about. Superpowers. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, uh, and this is deeply rooted in the uh, political discourse uh, mm-hmm. in Lebanon. Technocrat. We, we always hear about technocrat. Yes. What the hell is a technocrat? <laughs> uh, everything is about policy. So mm-hmm. you, you can get uh, uh, five experts on waste You will have five different opinions. Right. Uh, right. Uh, and then it's a question of sensibility. It's a question of policy. It's a question of choice. There is no right technical answer. There is a political answer. Uh, uh, To have renewable energy in Lebanon is a political decision, not a technical decision, because contrary to what a lot of people might think, and here maybe the young people will say, this guy is is maybe a bit old, he doesn't know anything about anything. Uh, uh, Renewable has pros and cons. Mm, Uh, mm, There is nothing, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, you you know, choice that is 100% valid. It's a question of policy. So once we acknowledge that there is no such thing as a technical answer to our problem, and that to have political choices substantiated by technical reasoning and that those people must claim power and the the political party, the nascent political party must take a choice on technical issue and present their choices to the Lebanese people and claim power on this base. Uh, I I believe we would have progressed a bit. You know, I'm, I'm glad you're outlining it in a way that's unusual. I don't usually hear that that almost uh, accept responsibility, take and own it. And I think you're hinting at agency in a way that reclaiming what we lost, which is real politics. Yes. And, and I want to go back in time a bit. I know just general information about your backstory. So I won't try to pretend like I know more than than I, I, I know little bits and pieces. Um, but we're roughly the same age. And, and we grew up in mostly the post-war environment. Probably probably have faint memories of the Civil War. They're not necessarily that fresh. But 1990s, I vividly remember, and I'm sure you do, that politics was really not there. Lebanon was managing a occupation, sometimes indirect, sometimes direct. And Syria's role in Lebanon, from my memory, really suffocated. And more or less killed politics the way you're describing it now. And I'm curious from your side, those illusions that you described earlier, and we can go through them one by one. Let's talk about sectarianism. I don't remember that word having so much uh, charge 
and and almost uh, toxicity back then as it does now. Yet it's the same model. It's more or less the same model. And it's the same groups of people that live here. Yet it didn't seem like the model was to blame. People were pointing the finger, Syria, Syria, Syria. Yes. And today all you hear is that the model is flawed, that Lebanon was almost born disfigured and that sectarianism, the word itself is the problem and everything else is a part of it. And that's something that's not easy for me to subscribe to. And you mentioned it earlier that sectarianism or perhaps the way Lebanon was put together is not necessarily an artificial thing. There is something there that Lebanese do govern a different way, a unique way that is out of step maybe with European countries and, and the like, but it seems to allay some fears when it comes to intercommunal issues. Do you, is it really just an issue of that the civil war ended, but the politics that you're talking about in 2021, the politics that we're all talking about didn't take place in 1989, 1990, that there was a 30 year almost paralysis in the discussion. And I'll give you just a, a token example. We all discuss it, the Senate that never happened. Something that yeah. could help the mosaic and then have a functioning parliament never happened. Yeah. So is it, the, in other words, is the illusion born out of the civil war that didn't turn into something that could function with agency or is it deeper than that? Would you put the burden earlier? Would you put the burden into the birth of Lebanon itself? Because I'm trying to find exactly where to, where the starting point is and how to move forward. And these yes. discussions happen all the time. And I'm wondering from your side, if, if you see an actual line that you can say that's where the problems began and whether or not that's an accurate way of, of looking at it. It's a, it's a very complex question. <laughs> so, uh, I apologize. I to... No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, don't worry. Uh, to give you some elements of, of uh, uh, no, I don't see a line. Definitely, I don't mm. see. A line. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the, the the one of the aspects of, of the, the Japanese problem is a mismanagement of diversity, uh, and also. Uh, an identity problem that goes back uh, to very, very uh, far. Uh, I believe, I don't believe in a line, but I believe in missed opportunities. Uh, I believe that uh, throughout our, our history, uh, we missed a lot of opportunity uh, after rounds of violence mm. Uh, mm. to be honest uh, about the root causes and uh, to uh, discuss uh, a sustainable system that would appease fears uh, of all the stakeholders of, of this yes. and also to produce a project that would uh, create a common identity. And uh, is that pre-1989 or is yes, that... Definitely, uh, definitely. So, okay, yeah. so these, these are uh, yes. fu fundamentals. Yes. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah. I believe that, yes, the birth of the greater Lebanon in, in 1920 was already problematic. Was right. Not by, by one. Uh, uh, in the 30s, you, you had so a lot of discussions about that uh, uh, sentiment of belonging and not belonging to, to the uh, a newly created uh, uh, country. Uh, uh, you had the first big clash in '58 that right. you had yes. uh, uh, like from an alarm bell, but nothing serious followed that. No memory and no structural thinking was done after, after that to understand what were the root causes and how to uh, establish or to discuss. Uh, the establishment of a system that would uh, 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 like include be inclusive of, of everyone. Uh, then in the early 70s, we, we had problems. And then you had the war that ended up without any work on, on the memory, on why we had this war, why it ended, what right. are the lessons learned, 
how to move forward. So the history of Lebanon is a series of missed opportunities and uh, a series of untold stories. Uh, and also uh, uh, maybe what's always there is some sectarian fears uh, that are deeply rooted within each sect, but that are not vocally admitted. So in the public sphere, we always have this dogma or illusion that everything is perfect and we live together. And, uh, and, and I believe that the, the founding or the recent myth uh, uh, of, of the Lebanese uh, 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 country, which is coexistence, is a very, very bad one. Because <laughs> honestly, honestly, I do not want to coexist with anyone. Uh, uh, honestly, so uh, coexistence is, is a very bad project. I always say that when you, when you marry someone, so you have a project, when you love someone, your promise to her or, 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 or uh, to him, it's not let's coexist together <laughs> <laughs> until the end of life. It's uh, let's have a project, let's have a baby, let's live a dream together. So uh, we are bound today to coexist without uh, 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 a more noble or a more engaging dream uh, uh, that will bind us all together as Lebanese. I believe, yes, that communities are not artificial, cont uh, contrary to a dominant discourse today that right. we say that Taifi or communitarism is uh, something that is artificially created and maintained by the actual leader. Right. I don't buy to that. It is maybe fueled by the actual le leaders to preserve also their system. But communitarism is something very deep and very real in Lebanon. And to build a new country, a modern country, we must acknowledge that. And this is not a shame, not right. a hype, you know. Okay, yeah, this exists. Okay, either we want to keep it like that and continue the lying and continue to live uh, in a system uh, that uh, is stabilizing and that is creating frontiers between community communities, or we want to say, let's transcend all that together and build a common project for an extra layer of a Lebanese identity that will involve us all, but based on the recognition of communitarian fears that a lot of Lebanese share. Uh, so I, I don't know if this is clear. Uh, no, no, but, it is. Uh, and, so no, yeah. and the, it, it's clear. And the reason I emphasized 1989 was because I was trying to find the, the point where this, these issues could have been properly addressed. And the case in point, the way you describe sectarianism as something very old, the problems surrounding sectarianism predate the civil war. Yes. And I mean, you're absolutely right. There were conflicts earlier. Uh, Lebanon was fragile at best. And civil war is probably the ugliest side of that story. But I was trying to find the moment that we missed, the, that, that big missed opportunity to actually get these things right. But I, I appreciate that you're, you're willing and, and, and able to offer something that's structural, that this is a foundational flaw that predates any geopolitical quagmire, and it actually exists with or without war, that it's flimsy at best. But let's jump from- But for me, 89 or, or hmm. 90, it's not really a debate because for me, what, what happened does not represent the will of the What happened there right, right. Uh, is uh, uh, we, we always say, we hear in the media, that Ta'if agreement uh, ended the Lebanese war. Uh, I do not agree that Ta'if agreement ended the Lebanese war. It is the mm. Syrian invasion yes. that ended the Lebanese war. And okay, Ta'if agreement was a constitutional arrangement mm -hmm. that acknowledged the transition to a new era. But uh, Ta'if agreement did not... Uh, uh, now I'm not pronouncing on if, if we need to... Uh, revise the constitution or not, this is another debate. But for me, uh, uh, the process was not, uh, uh, did not put, put all the uh, communitarian fears on the table and did not end up with a system that would be able to manage the Lebanese diversity and to transcend communitarism into a greater goal. 
uh, what right. ended the war is the Syrian equation, and that's it. And and even the Taif, Taif agreements were never uh, properly implemented. It died in 1992. So, yes, for me, it's not really a very important date in, in the process. You know, I'm glad that you're able to say it this way, that the end of the civil war is meaningless when it comes to reform. That yes. reform could not happen when you have Syrian, when you have the Syrian army and the Syrian regime taking hold of Lebanon. So if there is a proper date, and I'm sorry to keep pushing at this point, but I'm trying to find a big missed opportunity, at least in our lifetime, would it be 2005 when the Syrian army leaves? And the reason yes. I'm, and, and sorry to interrupt, but the, the reason I'm focusing on these obvious dates that we all know is because uh, I, I, I can't think of a better moment in my lifetime or a bigger missed opportunity to at least heal wounds that were born from the war, even if they're years and years later, even if, even if 15 years passed under Syrian rule, but still that that could have been the moment and that it just sort of was lost. Yes, in absolute, I totally agree with you mm. that 2005 was a missed opportunity uh, because I believe that in 2005, Lebanese resembled against something, uh, but we didn't have the maturity and we didn't have uh, only the institutions or yes. to be able uh, to engage in a national dialogue, to, to be able to do that and to project uh, a will of a nation, I, I don't like the word nation, but to be able <laughs> to build a nation. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you need to have a process. You need to have a maturity. You, have, you need to have a dialogue. You need to have syndicate. Yes. Uh, you need to have constituted bodies that would be able to engage, to dialogue, to... Uh, yeah. At least we didn't have. I believe that the Syrian occupation was really detrimental to the country, not only because it was an occupation, but because it killed all the uh, lively power uh, and uh, all the constituted body. And even today, we don't have proper orders, professional orders. We, we don't have syndicates. It's crazy today that uh, 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 in a collapsing country, uh, you don't have labor unions that are able to yeah. advocate, to represent uh, people that are suffering. All those elements are needed uh, to be able to uh, uh, to vet and uh, uh, to uh, 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 result uh, in a proper debate that will lay the ground of foundations of a modern, secular, and uh, diverse state, plural state. And this we didn't have in 2005. So I understand that it's a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. It is, yes. but the reasons behind it are pretty. And it helps explain why it's taken so long that these are issues that have been delayed for decades so that yes. the institutions were not even there to work with, or if they, they were there, they had, been, they had been perverted over time and that yes. they became a shell of what they're supposed to be. So I'll, I'll actually, uh, I'll take it sort of a step in a different direction because I, 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 again, I like the illusion and I like the outline that you offered. I'll jump into economics before getting into sovereignty. And the reason I want to do this first is because it's my understanding from every single discussion that I've, I've had, from every financial expert, some of them you've had on your show, we know these people, that in their mind, in their sort of broader view, the economic problems are bigger than the political problems, or that the economic story does not always match the political one, and that you can have economic reform without jumping too deep into politics. And for me, that doesn't resonate. I see it as actually flipped, that political issues will then help determine economic, the economic story altogether. And from your conversations, from all these financial experts and everyone offering an econ, everyone's an economic expert anyway in Lebanon today. So we, everyone has, a, has an opinion, but do you see that there's room for economic reform so long as there's political paralysis, like what we're living through right now? Or, or do you see it differently that it's still a political issue and that policies, if they're going to be born, they're going to be born from politics, not from financial experts or, or economists, without, without being condescending or harsh towards those experts, because I know that, that that is their field. 
but it just doesn't sink in well with me that you can ignore the sensitive issues while just touching on economic issues. So as much as you'd like to say on that. I, I will evade the question. Uh -huh. uh, no, because I, I really believe it's not a way. I, I do not believe in the separation of uh, economics and, and politics. Okay. Everything is political economy. Uh, mm. So mm. Uh, I, I do not really understand the separation uh, between those fields. Uh, if, if what you are hinting at, uh, let, let's take a concrete example, is that you cannot have uh, a sound economic recovery without settling maybe the Hezbollah uh, question, Hezbollah arms question. That's probably yeah. the most sensitive one, but there's, yeah. there's even things on the, the way. The, yeah. There are in between. Yeah. The, the answer is yes and no. Mm. Uh, mm. The answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, I could not. I, it's very difficult to envisage stability, long-term stability that is directed for an economic development uh, without settling the fundamentals uh, of uh, uh, right of war and peace and so sovereign decisions. But a lot can be done also. Uh, for example, Bank uh, uh, Reform Act or to reform banks or to reform sovereign debt. You, you can pretty much progress uh, on those issues without having to resolve uh, the whole, uh, the globality of, of uh, the, the Lebanese uh, issues. So, to back to my uh, initial uh, assumption, I, I believe it's unhealthy to separate. Everything is very linked. Uh, mm -hmm. You should have a holistic vision about a political economy vision. Everything is interlinked. And you could progress on many fronts, maybe independently, but you will never reach the wider goal uh, without progressing enough on the two or three fronts that so the two are married, that they're, then they're, you cannot separate them from each other in, in, yep. in, any, in, any, uh, in any real way that you have to tackle them at the same time, and that they impact one another. Yeah. Because, because I, the reason I was a bit harsh against or trying to be a bit sort of blunt is that it seems impossible to me, at least, to avoid politics in this country. And yes. that, that's likely because we have a failed state to a degree, or at least a collapsed state, mm -hmm. so that there's something structural that is off. And the structure matters when it comes to all other issues. But I, but I, I share that sentiment that you're right, you can't talk about economics in Lebanon without, without it being politically charged anyway. And that yeah, maybe the, the right definition is uh, sovereign issues, not politics, because economics right. But maybe sovereign issues uh, is a more appropriate de definition in my sense. So, yes, there is a link between sovereign issues uh, and uh, economic uh, and economics uh, in the country. Right. The link is not uh, a perfect link. You you could, uh, I believe, progress uh, on the economic front uh, without necessarily resolving uh, everything on the sovereignty uh, front. Uh, but of course, you will not reach the perfect uh, without having a holistic. Well, that's the perfect segue to sovereignty. That's my whole experience with post-war Lebanon, is fighting for Lebanon's sovereignty. And sovereignty, whether it's against Syrian occupation, or in today's climate, it focuses primarily on sub-state issues, whether it's Hezbollah now, could be something else later, but that that is the big story right now. And it seems to be not at the front of these discussions, even if it may be actually, it may be the most obvious stumbling block to reform, but it doesn't seem to always get that traction in, in, in broader debates. And I'm curious from your side, and it's a big question and it's just an individual take. Do you see this as something that is paramount, meaning what we were familiar with, Lebanon as a battlefield for conflict, or at least hosting components of that conflict, or even for that matter, Lebanon being able to withstand a proxy 
army like Hezbollah and trying to also reform. In your mind, is it possible to actually fix this country while ignoring that issue? And the reason I'm asking it is because that seems to be the debate and it's split. And that when I, when I say debate here, I mean mostly opposition camp or at least anti-status quo, that there's a divide when it comes to tackling this issue. And I won't ask you where you stand on this divide. That's not really maybe a fair way to ask it. It's more that, do you see it as possible to begin with? And if you do, what exactly could be touched on while ignoring this geopolitical story? And I'll say it up front, and I'm, you know this about me, and I've said this 259 episodes before yours, <laughs> that I just, I don't see any way around it, that Lebanon mm. will continue to crumble and collapse so long as this story is not addressed. I, I, fully, I fully agree with you, and it's not a secret. Mm. Yeah. I, I am vocal enough on this issue, yes. uh, while not being aggressive, because mm -hmm. uh, there is a... Uh, a thin line uh, uh, between affirming what you believe in and maybe aggressing uh, other beliefs. So, uh, mm, yes. no, I, I believe that this is uh, a paramount issue uh, of the basic. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot have a country uh, uh, that, that is not fully sovereign, you not have a country while you have a militia that is violent. There's violence in the internal uh, political sphere that has existed uh, in many on many occasions, and even uh, even if they don't exert it, the just fact that they are armed uh, is the violence by itself, because uh, there is uh, it's a non-equal uh, part of uh, so that there is no equality in the game when Hezbollah vetoes something or pushes for the election of a candidate, for example. For the presidency of the republic, it can uh, stop the country for years because it is armed. And it is a regional power. Is speaking here. It's not just uh, another political party uh, that being voted up uh, its opinions. So I'm, I'm very clear on that. Uh, that there is no, uh, for me, any, any confusion. Uh, the nuance, and not a nuance that I'm, I'm introducing, but maybe the matter of reflection. Yes. that I would like to, to uh, use here is that I, I believe uh, from intelli an intellectual uh, point of view that there is a link between that and the other two aspects because you like this framework about uh, uh, social pact and uh, constitutional arrangement. Uh, I believe there is a communication or there are links between the sovereignty issue and uh, also the way this country is governed and uh, what is exactly the social pact uh, mm -hmm. in this country from a perception matter. So uh, I always tend to always to reflect on why is uh, the Shia community or a majority, I don't know if it's a majority or a substantial part because I didn't do any research on step or statistics on that, but why is a substantial part of the Shia community uh, uh, attached or why does it adhere to Hezbollah's rhetorics, which are uh, from a religious point of view uh, important. They are not mm. alone. So uh, uh, the whole uh, dogma, religious dogma of Hezbollah is an important one. Mm. Are, mm. Not a uh, matter right. uh, in Jabal Ahmed, so we know that not history and tradition. Hmm. So, uh, question mark on why does this community uh, adhere to that? And maybe there are links to the social pact. Uh, maybe there are links also uh, to constitutional arrangements. Maybe this community uh, has a perception. Is it true or not? It's not for me to say. Uh, as long as the perception is there, uh, it must be treated. Uh, that it didn't get a fair place in the in the government. It, it was maybe left alone uh, 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 to face uh, some dangers. Uh, so uh, I, I respect the history of each community of mm. And beyond the mere condemnation, because I condemn it very vocally, and I repeat my condemnation of everything that Hezbollah stands for uh, in, in its armed 
uh, and also in its rhetorics and uh, ideology. I, I do not agree with what you yeah. uh, 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 But also, I believe it is our duty as young Lebanese, as people who try to think uh, and try to envisage the Lebanese, the Lebanon of tomorrow, uh, to question our, ourselves on the root cause uh, uh, of why this phenomena is so strong and so deeply entrenched in the South and in the But I, uh, pre I appreciate that that reflection is something that is not discussed often. Yes. It's look, looking at it through the social pact, or at least the, the flaws within it. I think that's yes. actually a nuanced take on reform, being able to alleviate some of the appeal towards yeah. Hezbollah, right? As opposed to the geopolitical story, something more within. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I believe also uh, we, we must address the, the, the levers that we can uh, have impact on. Right. So as Lebanese uh, today, as an individual or a political party or an advocacy group, uh, I don't have a lot uh, of uh, influence over the Iranian policy, uh, or I don't have a lot of influence uh, over the US policy. But what I can do is to engage in dialogue, uh, right. not to consider those people. Uh, the, I'm, I'm talking not about Hezbollah as an organization. I'm talking about the individuals, the supporters, the sympathizers, not to consider them as enemies. Uh, to, to try to engage in a dialogue with them, to understand what are their fears, why uh, do, do they uh, adhere to that project, and to try to build uh, a common ground. Because we, we are bound to live together, uh, Roni, and we are bound not only to coexist, because coexistence, as I said, is bound to be We are, are bound to generate something bigger uh, together. So I believe it is our duty. I don't like this word uh, as intellectual. I don't consider myself as being one. But as people who think, who read, who question, uh, uh, to go maybe beyond the mere condemnation and to try to understand more the root causes and to try to build uh, on them. But okay. without making any compromise on the principle. Right. Uh, uh, the principle of condemning uh, everything uh, that is extra state, every militia, every use of verbal and physical violence is sacred for me. You cannot compromise on that. This is a line of defense. But apart from that, you can engage, not necessarily with the organization, but with. In terms of principles and holding them dear, I share that sentiment fully. And I think the appeal of mass media and your position I think that's where the power is. It's in persuasion yes. and trying to at least address the issue in a constructive way. And yes. you're you're doing that weekly. And I think there is an audience for it on, on all sides. And I'm, 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 I'm sure that it may not translate into much when it comes to the geopolitical story. And you said it right. I mean, you don't have Rob Malley or... Jawed Zarif, yep. you know, on your WhatsApp list, or if you no. did, I'd be shocked. I would be. I'd actually tell you, delete, delete. I, I confirm that I don't have. Right, and short of that, you're able to at least have a Lebanese audience to better understand the conflict, and I, I appreciate that. And I we share this in, in private. Um, after Lukman Slim's assassination, a Absolutely. very a very difficult show to put together, and you did bring on somebody who was representing at least Hezbollah's position. And it's, it's, it's very sensitive. It's very, very difficult. But the show was tempered. It was very civil. And you let the audience decide who has the better approach and, and the healthier opinion. And you did it in a, in a masterful way. So I really appreciate that. Ronnie, th thank you for that. I just want to say something that is quite dear to me. Uh, I believe everything I'm saying uh, to you here is in my personal capacity. It's not as a journalist. Mm. Uh, I, I believe that the journalist's duty is to be impartial. Uh, we all have our opinion. Mm -hmm. And it happens that I have very, uh, you know, documented or not, but I have very uh, strong opinions about a lot of issues. But when I am uh, 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 preparing a show, uh, choosing my invitees, uh, uh, directing or running uh, uh, the plateau, 
I, I totally forget about my opinions. Mm. Uh, not uh, my agenda to promote my own beliefs. I'm not the judge here. And this is, uh, I'm saying it because in Lebanon, the practice of journalism, uh, it's not a criticism, it's just an observation, uh, is very elastic and uh, accept uh, uh, for journalists to have strong political affiliation uh, and accept that journalists are vocal about it and that journalists tend to substitute to public judgment and then right. make yes. their own yes. It, it could be a vision. Uh, I believe it's more also, it's maybe an American school. I don't know if it's correct. I, I don't really know very deeply the American culture, but I believe it's tolerated in a practice of journalism in the United States. I come more from a French school. Uh, I did not study journalism, but uh, uh, I, of course, was a, uh, an observator. Uh, and I believe that a journalist uh, should be uh, really or tend to be or try to be really neutral. And it's a matter of ethics. So for me, after the assassination of Ahmed Slim, that deeply moved me. Uh, and maybe I have an opinion uh, about who did it and what is the background. But I believe it is my duty as a journalist to stick to, to, stick to fact and to give everyone an equal share uh, of audience and to let people be the judge and to moderate it fairly, even against my own beliefs. And this is the trick of, of journalism. And it's my own understanding. So I'm, I did not learn that. Once again, I'm not a professional journalism, but that's the way I understand uh, uh, this uh, it's a fine line between defending what you hold dear, your own principles, which matter the world, and allowing a voice that completely goes against those principles without letting it interfere with the quality of the show. And I think you managed to do that in a, in a very, very uh, digestible way. I watched the whole thing and I, I mean, I was able to- You were not shocked. You were not shocked. What I, what I did notice, and this is, subjective opinion is that the the other guests were also so calm and so diplomatic where they didn't need to be all the time and that may be part of their charm part of their charisma is that they yeah. withheld their own emotion and at mm. times it did get a little touchy a little sensitive but it never it never uh i i appreciated the tone and that that uh, episode also knowing that Jad Ghassan is part of the show, that he actually helps edit it, I, I assume, or he, he's at least part of the production in the background, motivated me to actually go on his show later. That yes. I trusted his judgment, somebody I don't necessarily agree with, could yes. have fundamental disagreements, and we aired them out, but the yes. temperature was at the right level the whole way through. Absolutely. There's something there in terms of persuasion. I think you can talk about those sensitive issues in that format. You're doing it in a, in a very appealing way with a fast audience. Jad Ghassan has his own independent platform, but he's doing it in a very eloquent way as well. Absolutely. And he allows people to disagree, which I actually enjoy. He doesn't, he doesn't push back in a way that's, that's offensive. Quite the contrary. Brilliant. Albert, I want to wrap it up with something that is fundamental to the story. It's something I, I perhaps could have brought up at the beginning, but I saved it for the end. You're, you're a Lebanese citizen, uh, in a way, navigating your own path in this terrain. And when we first met, the first time we met was I think 2014, early 2014, at Sami Jmail's home. Yeah. So there was a dinner and I think it was just the three of us were sitting and talking. Um, it's funny that the conversations haven't changed much, but it's a familiar uh, conversation. It's, it's the 50s. Uh. <laughs> right, I, yeah, you put it's the same the people, country. exactly. They're always having the same discussion. And it's actually, it's quite depressing in that sense. But I'm curious from your side. I know that, I know that in a way your career has, has evolved and that, well, in addition to being a, a good friend with Sam Ismail and also his own shocking experience losing his brother, Pierre. 
and being sort of thrown into the spotlight. Yes. And your capability to know what it's like within a political party in Lebanon that's old, uh, that's deeply rooted, that has a very strong foundation, you've, you've succeeded, I think, in, in being an independent voice and also acknowledging that you have a friend, a, a, a good friend, who's now de facto leader of a political party that is reforming as well, and how you're able to juggle that. And I don't mean it in a sort of very, um, not bigger than what it sounds, more that, is this the future for Lebanon in your mind? Being able to, in a way, chart your own path on your terms, that it's more independent in a sense, rather than collective, that you're allowed to express yourself and also agree with a political party when you do so and disagree when you don't. Nothing is tying you down necessarily. And I hope I'm asking this right. Just yes, don't... you are, yeah. you are but you're perfectly right. It's a very legitimate uh, question. Uh, so the, 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 my relation with, with Sam Ismail is, is a very uh, um, personal relation that goes way back. Uh, and maybe this is an element of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I did not meet Sami on the late uh, in, in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, we met at the bench of uh, school, at this, uh, high school. Right, uh, yes. So we were very friends. Um, um, it was, uh, I don't know how we call it in English, it was the second. That second. So it, uh, the pen, pen ultimate year in, in, in school. And a friendship developed uh, based on common interests and common uh, understanding, uh, understanding of things, and a profound respect uh, also. I have a lot of respect for him uh, because I know genuinely what he does stand for. So uh, mm -hmm. I really know the man. You know how we say that uh, when you know someone his childhood or uh, early adult life, you know really his interior. And yes. I, I know really uh, his deep motivations uh, for the country. Uh, I know that he is tortured uh, to see the country in such a, such a shape. So I, I believe he has a very noble um, uh, mission or understanding. Uh, and this is what I, I care about. I care about mm. the genuine, his genuine mission. Now, we agree and disagree on a lot of things. Uh, right. But uh, the, the ancient uh, or the, the uh, how that the maturity in our relation and this old friendship and the respect because he knows also I believe what I stand for and I mm. know what he stands for so th there is no judgment no conflict no appropriation so when I choose to um, have my own independent path uh, and my own career it was not necessarily something against him or against the party. Right, uh, right, right. We kept the friendship intact, and you know, in, in life, uh, uh, you could diverge, or each one could have his own path and his yes. own affinities. You, you evolve. Uh, but the most important thing is to keep the friendship intact. And this is based on the knowledge we have on the intentions of each other. There, does it come down? This is to helping me to manage all, all, all that in a very good way. When I interview Sami, it's very. Uh, <laughs> I know the guy inside out. Right. And, yeah. And, and there is a line that I would never cross. Uh, I would never use something that I know about him uh, because of our friendship that I'm not supposed to know. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, never. And I would never make it easy on him because also I'm his friend. I forget totally who he is. And we resume our friendship after uh, the show. And th this is how it happens. So. Is it, does it come down to principles that, that there's yes. a foundation that you both share, even when you disagree on the politics of the moment, that the principles line up? Absolutely. I have the right to disagree on, on, on some issues. He has the right. But we... We both know that uh, the, 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 there is a common goal, you know, or a common perception of things, and we might disagree on, on, on some issues. Uh, so it, it's really not a problem. He understood it very well, and we manage very, very well uh, the relation. He, he accuses me uh, uh, sometimes to be a bit harsh on him, 
uh, in media uh, to try to prove my independence. Oh. This, might, this <laughs> might be true, and I, I'm saying it uh, loud because I was very stressed the first or, or two times that I hosted him or a cafe uh, personality uh, to prove to the people because people may, would not necessarily understand that. This is a guy that you know from childhood and that you worked with. How could you be independent? Uh, but I really am uh, towards him, and he respects that. You know, it's something very, uh, I, I must tell that. He's one of the few major politicians that I interviewed that didn't call the night after, uh, the night before, uh, or two days before to ask me uh, what would the questions be. Oh, yes. I, right. I respect that a lot because yeah. he knows. Uh, I, I don't believe it is his uh, his principle to do that, but regardless, that, he knows that I, I would not. Uh, th this would be something that I would be uncomfortable to do. So he never asked anything when he is on my show, and I respect that. And this shows a profound respect be between uh, both of us. You know, it's it's nice to hear your take, or uh, not your take, your experience with uh, with somebody who's well known to every Lebanese citizen. And your your ability to form your own path on your terms, without it destroying at, at least the friendship, but more so that you're able to still speak with each other about foundational issues, and that you probably agree more than disagree today on on the larger stuff, and you're doing it in a civil way even with him, and you're yeah. I mean he's in a, it's jovial perhaps to ask you to cool it on him, but that's your job, Absolutely. and your job is to treat him as one of many. And, and you're doing it you're doing it well and I'll, I'll say something from my side I even though I met you in that in that capacity I think of you more today as Kuluna Irada and I think that is sort of something very important that you've you've managed to also be involved in something that's purely reform related not politics the way we understand it in the Lebanese stuff that it's economic reform, political reform 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 and I think of you in that world today less kateib more reform yeah. and of course being a, a very sort of skilled host on tv and lbc is in good hands so long as you're there if you leave lbc i think the whole terrain will suffer and then you'll have to have your own podcast <laughs> i never compete with you no let, let me tell you something about lbc because i owe them also that uh, i owe that to to pierre dyer um very genuinely uh, lbc uh uh they 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 made, it was very daring to choose me because mm. I, I didn't have any experience of that. And what's more daring is the, the vision they had of creating an independent uh, show focused on content, not necessarily on, on ratings. Uh, and I owe that big time uh, to, to me because they, they are betting on youth, on, on some content, on, on a vision for tomorrow. And this is something really great. And it was before the collapse, uh, right. so we yes. saw yes. that happening, uh, and it's not necessarily a show oriented towards rating. Now we are getting very good ratings after the crisis. Right. Before the crisis, it was a confidential show. So I owe a lot to LBC. They uh, dared to, to do the adventure, not me. Yeah? So I was chosen by them, and I, 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 I did my part, but uh, uh, they did the major part. Um, Kuluna Irada, also to, to say a word about Kuluna Irada, I have a lot of hope and a lot of faith of Kuluna Irada. Uh, uh, and how I would describe Kuluna Irada is really it's a, a bunch of maybe the brightest characters that we <laughs> have in place. You have CEOs of uh, really worldwide corporations uh, that are on the board. Uh, it's really uh, an, an amazing quality. Uh, of people on the human level and the intellectual level and the expertise. And what's crazy about them is that they have zero ego. So I, I found people that have no ego. So uh, th those people are very disciplined. Uh, they have a big capacity to listen. They have a big capacity to learn. Uh, uh, and I was very humbled uh, uh, and proud uh, when those bright people, uh, so my, my curriculum is, is uh, really nothing compared to the, to the, the, the members of Colonna Irada. 
and they have elected me to be uh, uh, the, the chairman of the board. So it was a big honor for me to work with egoless, uh, bright, diverse people that have really absolutely no personal agenda. They right. just want to give back uh, a bit to the country because they succeeded all in their professional intellectual life. And they are putting the mission and the content at the heart of the engagement. And this is, this is where our path is crossed because I believe in the content. I believe in, in the depth of thinking. Uh, and this is the core mission of Kuluna Irada is to try to shape a modern Lebanon, uh, a secular Lebanon, an equal Lebanon, a functioning uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, deeply rooted in the Lebanese traditions. We are not here to create a Switzerland. No, we acknowledge the reality, but we <laughs> want to move uh, uh, Lebanon to where it belongs, and that is a modern state, because this is the aspiration of the Lebanese people. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about Kuruna Irada, because I really believe it's a fabulous group of people that uh, are trying to put the point. I'm going to link up a lot of information about Kaluna Irada on the episode. I know we ran out of time, but I want to say one last thing. Uh, I think it's the essence of your show and what you're doing. It's managed ego, um, real engagement, engagement that is unusual, at least when it comes to TV and TV shows in Lebanon, and also empathy. You, you have, you have and, and I think you wear it sometimes on your sleeve, which is quite nice. You are emotional about the country. And it matters to you. You're not somebody who's an opportunist here with the show and then on the first flight out. You have uh, your own sort of um, love for this country and it, ra it radiates. So we, we, we share that one. We do. We do. We and that. and yeah. it's, a, it's a real thrill for having you on this podcast. Right. When you need to set up your own, once LBC fires you, you call me. We'll get the podcast sorted out. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm kidding. We'll do it together. Yeah, we'll get Jad as uh, he'll give him a job as well. <laughs> Albert, thank you. thank you for your time. It means a lot to me. Thank you. It, it does mean a lot to me. Thank you and keep up the, the good work. Thank you. Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>